it's hard to come up with enough descriptors to uh, to describe our next guest. He's an author, a philanthropist, a tech entrepreneur, and now a political candidate. Uh, he is Wes Moore, the pride of Baltimore, uh, the author of The Other Wes Moore, and, and also here to talk with us about his impact and his oversight and insight on higher education and the view of higher education from industrial and cultural perspective. So, Brother Moore, it is an honor to have you with us today. The honor is all mine. I'm excited to be with you. Great to see you. You are now uh, a gubernatorial candidate for the great state of Maryland. Can you tell us about that decision and what makes you a good fit to lead the state, particularly at this time in history, where there's going to be so much transition for better and for worse in some respects, uh, but so much change that is is likely to happen leading up to the election here in our state? Yeah, well, I, I look at the fact that uh, we have seen very clearly and not just over you know the past year, but but throughout. That, that economic opportunity is readily available to some, uh, it is just dangerously absent to others. Mm -hmm. And I believe that no matter where you start, that you deserve an equal opportunity to succeed. And if you take a look at our state right now, you know we have some of the best schools in the country and some of the most underfunded, where you have some of the most prosperous communities and some of the most neglected. And by the way, they're side by side. Right. And, and so when I think about this and when I think about that component, that if we're going to have a real conversation uh, about true mo economic mobility for every person, true economic opportunity for every person, that it needs to be a holistic conversation. And where I and, and the, I look at the fact that I've been able to it's not just a personal thing for me where I've had a chance. I've seen from with my own eyes and my own life how these disparities show themselves. Mm -hmm. But it's also I think about the experiences and the professional experiences that I've had, whether it's leading soldiers in combat or having successful uh, business uh, here, you know, here in Maryland or whether it's leading one of the largest nonprofits in the country for the past four and a half years. I actually think our perspective and our experience is not just unique, but also it's the exact kind of experience that's going to be needed in this moment to be able to lead us out of this moment. You talked about some of your experience as a nonprofit executive, uh, your former CEO of the Robin Hood Foundation. Uh, late last year, uh, that foundation invited more than dozens of HBCU students uh, to come and be a part of an infrastructure training mechanism where folks of color can learn to, to get their hands around and their minds around money. What was some of the, the thinking behind that? And what do you think are some of the offshoots of that? Uh, so that folks, when they're coming out of undergraduate, going into graduate school or starting their careers, they can tangibly see here is how I can impact wealth, not just for myself and not just for my family, but for communities as well. Mm. I, I tell you, there, there are a lot of things that I'm really proud of uh, during my time leading the Robin Hood Foundation. Uh, this is one of them. It's the fact that, you know, the Robin Hood Foundation has really led this investors conference, uh, you know, really for over you know, the past decade where it brings in some of the world's best traders and, and investors. And it's a it's a conference where they're sharing ideas. They're sharing insights. They're sharing the things that they're trading. And one thing we've consistently seen is that for people who are doing this work uh, within this space, that the ideas, the best practices, the best ideas that they're sharing, these are things that also do well for people who buy into the Investors Conference. It was also always, though, a group, a, a smaller group of mm -hmm. people who would then get together, uh, a very homogenous group mm -hmm. that would get together. And one of the things that I'm very proud of is the fact that last year, uh, we, for the first time, especially when we went virtual, we said, no, nah, we're going to open this thing up. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to make sure that we have HBCU students there. Uh, we're going to make sure that we have HBU students who are there to listen and to learn and to share and to participate, both in terms of as, as a way of being able to open up uh, networks. But it's also a way of being able to say and in a very clear throated way that you belong in this room. Mm -hmm. You know, there is never a room that you don't belong in. And, and I and I think about that even in my own journey and in my own life. Where part of the biggest challenge I had at times was, you know, oh, you, you almost take on this imposter syndrome where you're like, oh, you know, I don't want nobody tapping me on the shoulder and say, what are you doing here? Or whatever the mm -hmm. case might be like, no, nah, there's never a room that I don't belong in ever. In fact, that room was incomplete until I showed up. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly the kind of mindset and mentality that we want for all of our HBCU students is that every single one of these rooms, you could have the top investors in the world. The question isn't. Why should you be in the room? The question should be, why haven't you been in the room in the first place? 
Right. And that's the type of thing in the frame that we put in place where, you know, and it's my my hope that the practice continues, it's, uh, you know, continues on throughout. Because I just believe deeply that we have to be inclusive and particularly for our students and particularly for our HBCU students, there should never be a room that they do not belong in. Do you think that it's America is trapped in a nexus of you react to inequality and inequity when there are glaring examples in your face? So we're, we're, we're talking about George Floyd. We're talking about coronavirus, but also your book, because that was a that was a, a ground shaking moment where you're saying look at inequity in a vastly different way. I'm black and I had opportunities and down my block, a brother who shares my name does not. Yeah. So that, that moves people in a seismic way. Are, are we better served by that when people have to hear horror stories, almost horror stories of inequity, or should we be pushing, pushing society to say, you ought not to hear the most violent, the most disparate examples of inequity to know that these are things that have to be fixed. I, I think that people need to hear truth. I think people need to hear honesty. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, is that the disparities that have existed within our society, they have been eating us at our own core. And we can't pretend like this doesn't come at a cost. Right. We can't just pretend like, oh, this is only hurting X group or Y group. If you look at the impacts, for example, of racial disparity, right, we're city group put together a report just last year indicating that the cost of racial inequity that we have seen has cost this country $16 trillion in GDP. Right. $16 trillion. That's not a cost to a group. That's a cost to the larger American economic machine. If you look at the cost of child poverty, child poverty costs this country every single year between 800 billion and $1.1 trillion a year. That's the cost of what it costs for the fact that we still are allowing children to grow up in spaces and places of poverty. And so I think the thing that we always wanna introduce, whether it is through the written word, whether it is through our policy making, whether it is whatever it is, I think the thing that we wanna consistently introduce is the truth. Because if we're leading with truth and we're leading with data and we're leading with these, these, these disparate facts and realities, the fact that race is still the predominant indicator for life outcomes that we have within this country, we lead with that. Mm -hmm. We're then able to make the structural changes that need to be made in order to prove that we're actually taking this seriously. You founded a company, um, an educational tech company that that emphasizes college completion and then job placement post graduation. Yeah. Um, that is a a margin that HBCUs live at in terms of taking the best and brightest and folks who are at the academic margins and saying, "Here's how we will implant you." into industry but there always seems to be a feeling that you know folks above us around us are talking about these issues are there things that our communities can do i guess even more so than we already are that kind of contribute to the conversation and say here it is from our perspective i know you guys are looking at us but here this is a message that we want to get to you about our struggle our opportunities our strengths our weaknesses are there ways that communities of color HBCU communities or even communities that, that are doing okay, but just haven't had the opportunity to be exposed. Yeah. The things that they can do, we can do for ourselves to advance that cause in corporate or political realms. It's such a great question. Um, you know, I, I think oftentimes when we see these type of situations and we specifically wanted to focus on students who oftentimes were first in family, first generation students. Um, and, and actually one of the first partnerships we had uh, was actually with Coppin, um, mm -hmm. with Coppin State, so, you know, an HBCU here right. in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, and, and one of the things I was always amazed by was when people talked about the challenges that students were facing, it oftentimes went directly to the academic and saying there's difficulty with you know, the academics, they're not doing well academically. Um, and it would always force me then to turn around and say, Let's be clear about what we mean by the difference between cause and effect, mm -hmm. right? Because you know the it, it's not that the academic the academic failings is the cause. The it's academic simple. failings, in many ways, it's the effects. Right, right. It's the effects of all the other things, the mm -hmm. other pressures that students are facing that we then had to be honest in order to combat, in order to deal with the long term effects, which is a student not doing well academically. Right. If you're not dealing with the issues of childcare, if you're not dealing with issues of food insecurity, yeah, 
if you're not dealing with issues of housing insecurity, if you're not dealing with issues of back payments, if you're not dealing with issues of transportation challenges, these are the cause. And the effect is the student is not doing well academically. If you could provide me a platform where our students know that the thing I have to worry most about that day is my biology 101 test, now we're winning. Mm -hmm. Right? Because then we can focus on what becomes that long term effect. The challenge is for so many of our students, the, 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 that biology 101 test is the 14th thing on their mind. Yeah. And that is where it gets complicated. And so really what we tried to do from that perspective was to build out a platform and working in unison and concert with the business community, the philanthropic community, the community, the higher ed community to really say, okay, what are those choke points? What are those things that's creating this level of difficulty and challenge that our students are facing? And then how do we go and we circumvent them? How do we go and then to address them in a way that actually shows that we understand where, how, where our students are coming from and what they are facing? And that then became really the birth of what we wanted to build out. And so when I think about it from that perspective, uh, just like any innovation, I think part of the reason that I think Bridget to you became so successful is, you know, it, it, it came out of a measure of necessity. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, any any interesting idea comes out of a measurement of necessity. The thing that we always wanted to challenge, though, is why was it necessary? to be able to create a bridge to you in order for students to be able to have proper pathways in order to find their long-term success. Then the final thing is what you have really addressed throughout your career and what you're talking about here today is how to change systems that, that promote equality and focus for all people. Right. Yeah. And, but there's a certain amount of trauma that is involved with what you do, what a lot of folks at HBCUs do folks who focus on poverty and education and, and eliminating disparities There's trauma with that because you have to drive in and out of that every day, literally every day. And literally some cases you're driving past it every day. How do you, how do you look to create a system, whether it be as governor, which would be state government, whether it would be as an entrepreneur, whether it would be as a benefactor or a philanthropist, how do you look to change systems where so many people, particularly now are wearing thin, of the trauma and the work of saying, I got to live a life that I've built for myself, which may be more affluent and more protected than the one I'm trying to change. And every day I'm putting on different masks. How do you live like that as an agent of that? How do we all live like that and say, I, I, it won't stroke me out. I won't have a heart attack. I won't go to bed every night saying I didn't do enough. How do you address the trauma of even working in this space to create equality? I, I think that there's... um. There's three things that we have to be able to do. Um, the first things we have to we have to understand that it's real. Um, I, I think that we have to approach this with an understanding that what people are facing and what we're all facing, it's not hyperbole. It's not exaggeration. Mm -hmm. It's not making stuff up. That feeling you feel is real and should be justified. The second thing is I think it's important to understand you're not alone. Okay. No matter what it is that you're feeling, trust me, the person standing to your left and the person standing to your right, they're feeling it too. Uh, this is something that we, this, this is a weight that we all fear. You talk about the mask, right? We wear the mask that grins and lies and it hides right. our teeth and it shades our eyes. I mean, like this is something that sits on all of us every single day. And so we have to appreciate the fact that the, we are, we're not alone in it. Um, and then the third piece is we have to stay focused on those things that motivate us. Mm -hmm. And I know for me, I have this vice grip of motivation mm. where part of the vice grip is our history, mm -hmm. our past. Part of a vice grip is, is, is not just my family's history, but it's the fact that I do come from a history of Tubman and Robeson I come from a history of truth and Du Bois. I come from a history of, of, of people who, who sacrificed deeply, who saw a world that they hoped I could actually live in and capture. And the second half of the vice grip is the future. Mm -hmm. All right, it's our kids, it's their kids. Um, it's the fact that right now, I believe in this moment, people will look back and ask us like, what did you do? How did you respond? Mm -hmm. And I think that we should have an answer. And so understanding it's real, 
understanding you're not alone and understanding your motivation behind keeping going, getting support and keeping going are the things that I think help to give me a, a relative sense of balance in all of this as well.